Good afternoon. I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank in Philadelphia. Um, here today, we have Ron Granieri, who is our regular host of People, Politics, and Prose, who's going to be joined by Jason Steinhauer discussing his new book, History Disrupted, How Social Media and the World Wide Web Have Changed the Past. This promises to be a really interesting discussion, and, um, and given that, we encourage you to start your questions and go ahead and any point in the um, in today's discussion, start putting those in the Q&A box. Uh, Ron has been known to draw on them in the initial part of the program, so we encourage you to go ahead and do that right away. Um, I'd also, before I turn it over to Ron, I would like to say um, thank you to our members and sponsors and uh, donors for the support you give us. We can't do this without you, so uh, we are truly grateful. And if uh, those of you who aren't yet members, donors, sponsors, I encourage you to consider uh, becoming one of those. Uh, so uh, Ron Granieri, who many of you know, is the director of FBRI's Center for the Study of, of the, excuse me, executive director of FBRI's Center for the Study of America and the West. He's also a history professor at the U.S. Army War College. And I also, uh, because of that, I am obliged to say that any comments he makes here today are his own personal views and do not reflect the United States government, the US Army or the US Army War College. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ron. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Raleigh. And thank you everyone for joining us. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this latest episode of People, Politics and Prose, FPRI's conversations with authors about their works, their careers, and the ideas that drive them. I am indeed Ron Granary and all of us at FPRI, thank you for joining us live on Zoom and tuning in afterwards recorded on YouTube. It is a pleasure to have you with us. Who controls the past controls the future. And he who controls the present controls the past. That is the rather grim comment that one can read from George Orwell about the meaning of history. And most people would agree that history is important, that it matters. But the question of who is responsible for teaching it, what should we learn from it, how should we share it with each other, these are questions that have continued to trouble societies and will continue to trouble us for quite some time to come. They have taken on new meaning in our contemporary social media world where instant access to information and the uh, effectively instant ability to compile, record, and share that information has broken down traditional barriers between historians and the public. In his new book, History Disrupted, Jason Steinauer analyzes what he calls this new phenomenon of e-history along social media and considers how new technologies are shaping or deforming not only our understanding of historical events, but our understanding of how historical knowledge is created and shared. Now that people can find and consume history through websites or social media videos much more easily than through textbooks or school lectures, Steinhauer argues, quote, e-history has grown so pervasive and omnipresent that it has come to represent what we expect all history to be. Its values and mores, intimately shaped by the values and mores of Silicon Valley, have changed the definition of history right before our very eyes, close quote. Drawing on his own work and presenting history to multiple audiences and on multiple platforms, Steinhauer offers a survey of the new technologies and their impact, offering conclusions that are alternately fascinating and appalling. The social web, he writes, quote, privileges the attributes of a piece of content more than its veracity or accuracy, close quote, creating an environment where distinctions between experts and enthusiasts, between analysis and propaganda are elided and where, quote, the tale of online success may wag the dog of discerning what might have actually occurred. In this sprawling and chaotic e-history universe, which has grown without any plan or agenda, it cannot be unmade, but its consequences are destined to shape our relationship with history for decades to come. So what is this brave new world that has such websites in it? How did we get here? And how do the different parts relate to each other? And what does any of this mean for the public's understanding of history or of civic engagement with the past? These are some of the questions we will address today in conversation with Jason Steinauer. 
FPRI Senior Fellow Jason Steinauer is a global fellow at the Wilson Center, contributor to Time and CNN, a past editorial board member of the Washington Post's Made My History section, a presidential counselor of the National World War II Museum, and former founding director of the LePage Center for History in the Public Interest. In 2020, he founded the History Club on Clubhouse, which he hosts regularly for its more than 100,000 members and an average of 2,500 listeners per week. In 2021, he created the first cryptocurrency devoted to history, Jason Coin, which will be used to provide grants for public-facing history projects. In 2014, he coined the term history communicators and has worked with colleagues worldwide to develop the new field of history communication and is the founder of the History Communication Institute. In diplomatic exchanges and public events and media appearances, both in the United States and in Europe, he is one of our leading experts on the effects of the web and social media on public understandings of news, history, and information. And we are delighted to have him with us today. Welcome to People, Politics, and Prose, Jason Steinauer. Well, thank you for having me, Ron and Raleigh and all of FPRI, a great institution that I've been fortunate to be associated with for five years now. And uh, yeah, all those things that you said are accurate and true, but hearing them back, it's kind of like, wow, that's a lot of stuff. I don't know. That's right. Maybe I should yeah. go to social life or something. I don't know. Or something. I don't know. You look you, you look pretty good for guys who've been burning the candle at both ends for the last uh, decade or so in uh, e-history. Well, it turns out that writing a book is a really hard thing to do. This is my first one. I've been involved in other people writing books, uh, but this book actually took about five and a half years to research and write, which when it came back to me from the publisher, I was surprised that it was this thin. It's only 160 pages. When I turned it in, it felt like a lot bigger than that. And it was clearly like a, a lot more labor than that. And then when it came back, I was like, oh man, maybe I shouldn't have taken so much out. Maybe I shouldn't have done so much editing. But um, it's... Uh, yeah, it's, it's been a long road to get to this point where this book has been published, and I'm excited to talk about it with you. Outstanding. I was going to say, books are always much bigger when they're sitting on your shoulder reminding you that they need to be finished. Um, and of course- Or the Microsoft Word say, document that you turn in, right? You send in right? this 300-page or 400-page Word document, and you're like, ah, this is going to be a nice, thick, hefty book, and then it comes- Anyway. <laughs> anyway, well, I was going to say is that I received the book, of course, electronically on my Kindle app. So it's this big, right? And of course, we're going to talk precisely about that kind of challenge uh, about technology. And, you know, it is a funny thing, right? You talk about that book took you five and a half years to write. And the idea of a an expert, an individual author spending all that time researching, writing, sitting by himself, something that while he's writing it is only being read by a handful of people until it's ready to be shared with the world. That's a lot different than a blog post. It's a lot different than a YouTube. YouTube conversation like the one we were having. And um, you you jump right in in the book talking about this, this new environment, this e-history. And so I wanted for, for our audiences for you to describe what are the parts of this new uh, biosphere of e-history? What are, what are its major component parts and what makes them, what connects them to each other? So this book began with a question. And the question that I started out this book with five and a half years ago, was why does certain history content online and on social media reach our eyes? And why is there some content that we never see? And so the more I looked into this question, and of course, by the way, this can be applied to science and to news and to politics and health. I was particularly interested in how it applied to history. The more I looked into it, the more I began to realize that at heart, there was a fundamental clash of values in my estimation between the professional discipline of history and the way the social web has been created. And so I argue in the book that history, to your point, is a expert-centric, always evolving intellectual pursuit, which is time-consuming, five and a half years to write a book, for example, and relies on its intrinsic value. In other words, to the point you made at the beginning of the intro, history is valuable because it's valuable. It doesn't need to be valuable for any other thing except for in of itself. It helps us learn something about the world, right? Well, the web has been set up to be, in many ways, the opposites of those things. The web is user-centric, not expert-centric. It privileges the experiences of users. It doesn't care if those users are experts or not. The web is, at heart, a commercially driven and data-driven enterprise. Uh, it's not an intellectual endeavor. It wasn't designed to be. It was designed to collect people's data 
and to use that data to drive a commercial engine. It's also instantly gratifying. It promises to give you quick answers, uh, quick results, instant searches, instant information, and it relies on extrinsic values. In other words, things are valuable on the web if they have a lot of clicks, views, and shares or other extrinsic uh, measures of valuation. So this to me seemed like a fundamental clash between two value systems and the way that history and gets transposed into the web and that, that gap between value systems gets bridged is by something that I've calling e-history. And so in just the way that we have e-commerce and we have e-books, we also have e-history. And e-history is the way that a expert-centric, always evolving intellectual pursuit, which is time consuming and relies on intrinsic value, gets maneuvered into this uh, user-centric, commercially driven, instantly gratifying, extrinsic architecture that is the social web. And so that is the premise from which the book unfolds. Right. Well, and let's let's dive right into that because there there are there's a lot of of angles to discuss, but we'll we'll start with the one that's that's obvious, right? As uh, and that is, what is the relationship between the producers and the users? Um, in the sense that we can talk about, uh, we'll talk about experts in a second, but just in general, right? The the internet does have this tendency of being a great place for the aggregation and the sharing and the the repackaging of information that's produced someplace else. But what is the place of the production of ideas, let's say, um, in e-history? Well, one important distinction, I think, in the book I try to make this, is that there's a difference between the internet and the social web. And so okay. I'm talking about the social web here, right? The internet is the, sort of the infrastructure that makes the social web possible, but the social web and the internet is kind of like a square rectangle thing, like they're not exactly the same. Right. Um, so a lot of things happen on the internet that don't involve the social web, for example, email, right? So I'm particularly looking at social platforms that have arisen over the past 20 years. And those platforms that I talk about in the book are Wikipedia, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and to a later extent, Clubhouse, and then some of the emerging AI technologies, and then a little bit on crypto as well. So what do all these platforms have in common? Um, well, for one, they rely on a high volume of transactions for their value. So when I looked at Wikipedia, for example, Wikipedia initially had a companion site called Newpedia. And Newpedia was a online version of an encyclopedia that was intended to rely on experts in order to, pro to produce articles. But Newpedia ended up spending six figures, I think about 250K, to produce only about 18 articles. And so it just didn't have enough transactions to be a viable product on the social web. And so Wikipedia came along and said, actually, if we allow anyone to contribute to this and then allow anyone to edit and allow those people to become sort of the gatekeepers to these Wikipedia pages, that will get a lot more transactions and a lot more people using the platform and that will drive the value up. And that's indeed what happened. And in fact, Wikipedia initially was wanted to sell advertising. And so that was one of the reasons that they had this in mind because the more eyeballs and the more transactions, the more advertising dollars they could charge. The same is true of Facebook. Facebook works on transactions, clicks, views, shares, time on the platform. Twitter, the same thing. Instagram, the same thing. Clubhouse, the same thing. NFTs and crypto, the same thing. So when you ask this question about users and producers and consumers, and it's it's about transactions. And I talked about this in the book, right? All e, all history, all e-history that's created on these platforms is ultimately a transaction. Even if your intent is to be educational or to be promoting some sort of great cause like civic education or social justice, ultimately you are engaged in a transaction because that's how the social web has been created. And that transaction happens you know, in a number of different ways. Your data being sent to the platforms for them to refine their algorithms, people clicking on your information, whether those people are experts themselves or non-experts, you know, driving people towards websites, all the transactions that we are familiar with, that is at the heart of this e-history universe, as well as the larger social web universe. Well, and I'm, I'm reminded of one of, uh, I'm going to show my age, right? One of my favorite New Yorker cartoons um, is the, uh, the, the famous one of a dog sitting at a computer screen, turning to a fellow dog and saying that online, nobody knows you're a dog. 
Um, and and the uh, <laughs> the idea being that uh, you know a user is a user on on an, on a on a particular social platform. Some social platforms require users to use the real names and real photos. Not many. Um, and so the the question then of uh, and you bring this up when you talk about how the idea that it's it's more about the the virality is more important than veracity when it comes to uh, to historical material. And is there something? Uh, I mean, I guess you know we don't have a lot of discussion about alternate um, mathematical interpretations on the internet or on social media, even though there are social media sites that show you how to do quadratic equations. Um, is there something in particular about history that makes it? Both, especially a rich uh, vein for being used in the in social media, but also something that um, you know, does it do anything particularly damaging to history for it to become e-history? Well, one of the things I make a point of in the book is to say that e-history is created by a wide range of people, including experts. It's created yep. by historians. It's created by journalists. It's created by activists. It's created by disinformation agents. Right. E-history is the mechanism by which these value systems get bridged by some by how something that is time consuming becomes instantly gratifying on the web. And by instantly gratifying, I mean, like if you were to get a, try to answer a historical question the way it's done in sort of the scholarly publication cycle, you would have to go to the archive, dig through things, analyze sources, primary and secondary. Right. The web doesn't you don't need to do that on the web. The web delivers you an instant instantly gratifying answer to a difficult historical question, even if it's not necessarily the accurate answer to that question, it will provide it to you because that is what the web is set up to do. And later in the book, I talk about things like Amazon Alexa and Siri that you know, are trying to get you the quickest answer possible. And they rely on things like Wikipedia or Amazon Answers or Quora in order to do so. So again, it's about the transaction and the volume of transactions, not necessarily how accurate that information may be. And indeed, Wikipedia entries change all the time. So you could ask a question to Alexa one day and get one answer, and then a week later, ask the same question and get a different answer. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's that aspect to it. But I think more to the, the point of what you're getting at with your question is that I what I found when I wrote this book and researched this book was that ultimately, the history online that conforms best to the values of the social web and to what the platforms incentivize and reward, that's the history that we see. And so it has no direct correlation with the accuracy or veracity of the information. It just has to do with how well it conforms to the values of the social web. And so at the end of the book, I kind of was left with the realization, at least in my estimation, that all this e-history we encounter doesn't actually improve our understanding of history all that much. What it does is it further embed the values of the social web deeper into our lives. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean by this? Let me give a concrete example, because I know this is very meta and very abstract, right? So this question of virality, right? We reward content that goes viral with attention, with fame, with money, with media coverage. So when you look at a platform like Twitter or YouTube, for example, if we as a ecosystem, a social media ecosystem, a media ecosystem, reward virality, what does that incentivize people to do? It incentivizes them to find formulas to send things viral through networks. It doesn't matter if those things are accurate. What matters is if they can go viral, because if they go viral, people will get rewarded mm -hmm. with attention and fame and money and everything else. So if you apply this to history, I talk about this in my book in a chapter called The Viral Past, there was a whole series of accounts run by, in some cases, teenagers in Australia who confessed to hating history and not wanting anything to do with history. But they figured out a way to send historical photographs viral through Twitter. And even if those photographs were doctored or imaged or there was no context or captioning around those photographs, or even if the captions were inaccurate. But because they figured that out, they got rewarded by the ecosystem. They got profiled in major media. They received millions of dollars of funding. They built a whole company around this. Mm -hmm. And millions of people saw this stuff. So that is the uh, incentive structure at work that privileges certain content. And if you are a professional scholar and you're not able to make your content go viral, then no one's going to see it, regardless of how accurate it is. That's just how social media is set up. So one of the things that I've been trying to talk about in the conversations around this book is how can we create a better set of incentives for the next iteration of the web? Because I particularly don't think that virality is a very good incentive that we should be rewarding. Yet we seem to be in this trap where we keep doing it. 
And that's why I say at the end that the history you see on Twitter, for example, you're seeing it because of all these other factors. And so it's not really teaching you much about history. What it's doing is just reinforcing to all of us about how important it is to send stuff virally through networks because that's how you'll get rewarded. And, and I guess that's where, so ultimately then, you know, history is just the, uh, it's just the material at hand, right? It's because it's, it's got nothing to do or it's got, well, actually, let me, let me take a step back. Oops, Turn right okay, to right. South that's, the, that's the internet deciding to speak to me while I'm trying to do this. That's exciting. I forgot to turn off. A, the, Siri the got mad oh, because we brought her up in conversation. We brought her up. We we're talking about that. My apologies. But, um, but the, what this is what I'm struggling with is on the one hand, the way you describe this, and I, I, I get the point, it's an important one, is that, you know, Siri is more, or, or the internet is more interested in, in uh, it's the virality, it's the transactions, that the stuff being transacted is secondary to the reality of the transaction. That's one part of what you're saying, if I got that right. But at the same time, you point out in, in many of your, of, of the examples you use, that there is a particular stuff about history that grabs people, right? Pictures grab people, right? You know, particular stories grab people, and they can become viral in particular ways. And that's why this is what I find very interesting. So, on the one hand, the idea of the uh, the the virality or the transactions are kind of uh, content neutral, but history is a particularly appealing bunch of content. And I, so I, I wonder about, you know, how do we, how do we reconcile those two with each other? And then one other thing that you mentioned it and I wanted to reinforce is several of the platforms, organizations, uh, uh, sort of uh, nodes of virality that you discuss um, use as part of their selling point. History is boring. History is awful. You hated history in school, but here's something cool which of course is still history, but, and it, which also raises that interesting question about where do we, how do we as a society, right? We are obviously all interested in history, but we all say that we hate history. And I say this as a historian who's had to listen to people tell them many times how they didn't like history in school. And so how do we make sense out of that? That history is at the same, you know, that the social web is about the transaction, not the material, but history is material that really, uh, that really grabs people. But everybody also says, or wants to market this idea saying that history is boring and nobody likes history. How do we make sense out of that? Well, if you read my book, it will make sense. Uh, but let me try to uh, say it briefly here. We can get more into it in the Q&A. So I talked about at the beginning how I see these, these value systems that are sort of at odds with each other and e-history bridges that gap. So then I had to, in the book, I had to get back to the next question, which is, okay, so why does certain history become visible on certain platforms? And so the book, each chapter of the book talks about a different mechanism by which history can become visible on the social web. The first chapter is about crowdsourcing that starts with Wikipedia, but then it talks about other crowdsourcing platforms like Quora or Reddit or Amazon Answers. Then there's something I call Nostalgia on Demand. Uh, this starts with the app Time Hop, but then talks about a lot of this on this date content, like this day in history type stuff, which is really just, I think, a glorified version of nostalgia. And then I talk about virality, which is largely focused on Twitter, but again, can be applied to things like YouTube. Then I talk about the visually arresting past, which largely focuses on Instagram, but then extends to other places. And so to your point, the, the purpose of all of this stuff is to find a way to grab our attention. And so you can grab my attention with history content if it's going viral, or you can grab my attention with history content if it pulls on my nostalgic heartstrings, or you can grab my attention with history content if it gets crowdsourced to the top of my feed, or you can grab my attention with historical content if it has a really visually arresting image that stops me from scrolling for a second to say, whoa, that's cool, or whoa, that's pretty. Right? These are all the different mechanisms by which history becomes visible on social media. And what was interesting to me writing the book and researching the book is how consistent this was over 20 years. It's almost like we all have sort of, without saying it out loud to each other, kind of figured out that these are the different mechanisms that we can use to get our attention, our, our content seen by people. And so we keep relying on them uh, from across platforms. Another example I talk about is the newsworthy past. If you can find a way to peg information about history to the news cycle, that can make it visible. Mm -hmm. And then I talk about storytelling, how if you can make history into a good story, that will make it visible. And finally, I talk about AI and how AI can surface things to people and make it visible. So 
is there something unique about history content? You know, I've had people who read who are in the sciences or who are in politics who have read or in diplomacy who have read this book and said, wow, like I could just insert science into this book instead of history. And like there would be a lot here that still, you know, is relevant or even like politics. Right. So I think. Yes and no. Yes, there is something about history content um, in the fact that it involves actual people who lived on this earth. And those types of things do make us curious and do make us fascinated. And, and that becomes a way to get us to transact, to click, to view, to share. Uh, but I think these mechanisms can be applied to other disciplines. And it's, I'm finding that to be the case as more people in more disciplines read the book. Mm -hmm. The last point that you made, I think, is an interesting one, which I talk about in the book as well. Repeatedly, you see online this content that sort of bills itself as the antidote to history, right? The relief from your typical history, whether it's the history podcast that doesn't suck or the history you didn't learn in school, yes. right? So history does have this reputation of kind of being boring and stiff and maybe not well taught. And so a lot of online content creators leverage that as a way to get your attention, but they'll still use the same techniques, right? Mm -hmm. Newsworthiness, visually arresting, trying to send things viral through networks, uh, but they'll wrap it in this, uh, this trope of mm -hmm. the history you didn't know or the history that you never learned or the history that doesn't suck or the history that isn't boring. Right, um, right. So that, that's, that, there's a theme there that's sort of thread throughout the book in the midst of some of this other stuff. Right, yeah, there's a lot of, everybody wants to show you the hidden history of something. Um, that, that's a, that's a very common phrase. So a, a question from the audience from Lawrence Husick, which, uh, I, I, I want to rephrase a little bit, but the, he notes that there's a very prominent American historian, Heather Cox Richardson, who over the past several years has daily produced a newsletter of historically informed political content. Um, and it, the, in her, the, she calls them letters from an American. And it is, it is fascinating because I, I, I would, I would suggest that it's somewhere in between what we're talking about here, because she is very clearly, Professor Richardson is very clearly an expert using expert knowledge. Um, she's, pro she's producing it on the web, uh, on, on social media, but in a newsletter form that is not exactly as widely available. And that's what I, I wonder about this, the role of, uh, as I think about newsletters and Substack and these new ways where writers are trying to reach the public directly without without going through the typical gatekeepers of publications or even the typical gatekeepers of social media um, uh, platforms like Facebook and Twitter and, and Instagram. Where does that fit in, in your definition of, of e-history, that kind of work? Yeah, so I know Heather, she's brilliant. Uh, and she was a guest at the LePage Center a couple of years ago for an event. Um, she was my TA when I learned the American <laughs> Civil War in college. Yeah, she has a great new book out about <laughs> how the South won the Civil War, which I recommend yeah. everybody read. Um, so, I, so a couple things about Heather Cox Richardson, Kevin Cruz, Joanne Freeman, Ibram Kendi. There are a number of historians, a, a yeah, small yeah. number, but a number of historians who have really benefited from this e-history uh, universe, this e-history ecosystem. Um, this is you now nothing that I say is meant to disparage any of their contributions. I think they're all brilliant historians and I, I, I enjoy all of their work. I will say though that people such as Kevin Cruz, Heather Cox Richardson and, and Joanne Freeman who have become sort of social media superstars over the past five to 10 years, they have some built-in advantages that others do not, right? They mm -hmm. are tenured professors at elite institutions. They don't have to worry about job security. They have uh, the ability to speak freely online that maybe like public historians who are working in state government or federal government or local government don't have. And um, they also happen to work on one of the most newsworthy topics of our moment, which is American conservatism and the Republican Party, yep. right? So they benefit from the newsworthy past in a way that scholars who are working on maybe indigenous communities in Bolivia or French women in the 16th or 17th centuries do not. They also happen to live near major media centers, which gives them exposure to platforms like NPR and MSNBC. And indeed, Heather Cox Richardson did have a podcast on NPR, which she did with a journalist named Ron Klein before she branched out on her own. So she has a lot of built-in advantages that have helped her build her profile over the years, which is not to say she's not brilliant. It's just that these are things that not all historians and social media users have access to. So in some ways, when I think about 
the social media superstars who have emerged from this, I sort of equate it to like, you know, do we judge the health of the economy economy based on how well it works for Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos, or do we judge it on how well it works for the sort of larger populace, right? And if you look at the larger swath of historians out there, we have a crisis. We have history departments uh, being consolidated, uh, tenure lines being removed, faculty retiring and their jobs not being filled. Uh, there's funding crunches across history museums. Small history museums are closing left and right across this country and the American Association for State and Local History has ac actually been documenting that. And I think that the e-history universe that we're living in has contributed to that. So while it does work for a few privileged few, overall the picture and the headwinds uh, for history are, are bleak and strong. Yeah. When I, it particularly I, comes yeah. to, uh, just one last point, when it particularly sure. comes to Substack. So, you know, Substack is interesting, right? Because Substack is actually not really a social media platform. It's right. an expert centric mode of communication, right? You have an expert at the center of communicative power and that expert communicates out to readers and the readers, mm -hmm. maybe they leave a comment, maybe they send an email back, but it's not really the same dynamic as something like Twitter or Wikipedia or Facebook. Yeah. So I do think that there's a lot of promise and potential in platforms like Substack. I have a Substack as well, if you wanna sign up for it. I think there's some cool stuff on there. I'll put the link in the chat. Um, but I think those are slightly different platforms than the ones of Web 2.0. But I actually, I think there's a lot of potential with those types of platforms to build different communities and different types of incentive structures than the ones we've had over the past 20 years. Yeah. Well, and, and it is, there's the paradox of the, the breakdown of the traditional gatekeepers, right? Because the idea was that the, the traditional gatekeepers probably, it was easier to get it noticed by the traditional gatekeepers if you were already well connected, if you went to the right schools, if you had the right connections. But once you were picked up by uh, the uh, by a gatekeeper, right, you, you automatically had uh, some kind of a significance. When you remove the gatekeepers completely, or when you undermine the gatekeepers, the people who have connections and the people who have the right uh, pedigree are likely still to be able to do just fine, but it does create problems for those people who are outside because they don't know what it means to get inside, right? Is that you can, you know, lots of people, there, there may be a lot of brilliant historians who are writing brilliant comments every day to their two dozen followers on Twitter every day, just like there may be, there may be brilliant historians and uh, talk show hosts who, uh, who you know only have conversations for a couple of hundred people every uh, every month? That can right. happen, yeah. and that's and and so that is that issue of you know we, we there's the possibility of getting out there, but then still getting virality, getting people to notice, is a uh, is an ongoing challenge, right? And that uh, if anything, that's harder now than it was before. Right, and this is this is the sort of the promise and pitfalls of the social web, right? Because mm -hmm. it promises, it offers us this promise of visibility and this promise of expanding our audiences and expanding our reach and reach and reaching more people. But that's one of the reasons I wanted to write this book because it's like, okay, let's match that up with the actual reality. And mm -hmm. it turns out there's actually very specific mechanisms that people use to do just that. And if you don't use those mechanisms, you don't get any of that. You don't get any of the benefit. And in fact, it actually can really cause a lot of harm because it leads to these other erosions of the history profession that are happening sort of beneath our feet. And so we look at, I talk about this in the book in the last chapter, it's sort of equating it to bright stars and bright planets, right? We look at the bright stars and bright planets of the Heather Cox Richardson's of the world and the Joanne Freeman's of the world, who I love. They're brilliant. I'm so glad they're out there, but they are only 5% of the universe, right? The other 95% is what we need to look at. And if you look at that, you realize that there are a lot of headwinds facing the history profession and many of those have been brought on, I argue, because of the social web and this e-history universe that has been created. And the fact that we now, as a society, only seem to value the history that does go viral or does grab our attention some way. And so we then don't fund and don't elevate and don't promote, promote the work of all these other brilliant historians who are working on all these other crucially important topics, topics which have intrinsic value but because they cannot manifest extrinsic value on the social web, we ignore them and we don't fund them. And, and so I guess that's where the, the, the question of, you know, what is, what is to be done, right? It's, is that it's no, it, it, 
and I get this from reading your book and and from us talking about it too, right? It it makes no sense for for you know experts to stand around or among themselves to you know to sit back in their club chairs in the mythical faculty clubs of the world and say, oh, people don't appreciate experts anymore, because um, that's that's both true, but in and of itself, that's irrelevant. The question is more: How do we consider and uh, how do we find ways to bring? history content, history discussions, and awareness of the complexities of making history to a broader public in the face of these headwinds? Um, can you can one use these same platforms or simply, basically so the, the, the thing I came away a little depressed by, by some of the conclusions in your book, one of them is that the um, that using these platforms, um, you know, you're more like, the platform is more likely to, to use you than you are ultimately to use the platform. And so, where does where does that leave us? Yeah, so uh, I, this is where I'm kind of heading in my own work. I think mm -hmm. we need different incentives and structures for the future of the web. I, mm -hmm. I don't think that a future of the web that's built on the mass collection of data and the and the turning that leveraging of that data into you know advertising platforms or um, you know incentivizing virality and, and all the other things I talk about in the book. I don't, I don't think these are good incentives. I think we need to build different incentives. And I think we need to build different incentives with a much more diverse group of stakeholders at the table. I think it can't just be engineers and venture capitalists in the room building products. Then those products come out and we all rush onto them and start using them without even knowing what we've jumped into. And this is another theme throughout the book, right? Wikipedia comes out, everyone rushes to use it. And then 15, 20 years later, we're like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have done that. And then Facebook comes out and we all rush to use it. And then Twitter comes out and we all rush to use it. And so this happens time and time and again. These platforms and the assumptions and the value structures are built in you know, Silicon Valley by engineers and venture capitalists who have very particular things that they want to see, right? And then it comes out and we all, like this is another thing that's in the book, we are all complicit in this, including myself. We all right. rush onto these platforms and try to use them because we think it's going to be good for our careers or good for history or we're going to get more media coverage out of it or whatever. And then we look up and it's too late. And we've, we've created this chaotic world that we now have to sort of unmake. So I think we need to build different types of platforms with different types of incentive structures, have different and diverse groups of people at the table, not just intellectual diversity, but racial diversity, ethnic diversity, religious diversity, political diversity. And we need to be more thoughtful about this. And then we need to rely on different tools that do different things. So this is one of the reasons why I think there's some possibilities for things like Substack, right? Because, or even Clubhouse, mm -hmm. which I've been using a lot. Clubhouse has its issues, 100%. I've written about those issues. But, you know, it's very hard to make an audio conversation go viral. There's no virality incentive on Clubhouse. And that's one of the reasons why I like it because we're not trading memes back and forth. We're not you know, arguing with links or clickbait. We're having a conversation like we're having right now. And we can have that conversation for an hour and a half or two hours and get a lot of different voices into the mix. And we can walk away from that conversation feeling much better than if we just traded memes back and forth to each other. So I think... I think there are tools out there that are coming. I think we need to develop more of them and we need to collectively move away from these incentive structures that we've all had a hand in creating, including you and me and everybody on this call. Right. Well, and and so I see a couple of questions that come in that relate precisely to this this question of you know what can we do and how can we do it better, but also what is this relationship? Is you know and one anonymous attendee specifically asks you know what has e-history done to our understanding of an event like the Holocaust? Um, when we talk about something, you know, does it, you know, by, uh, let's say by, by privileging the what's virality and by undermining the, the, uh, the, the, the importance of veracity, right, does it make it easier to, uh, to spread misinformation or to deny? Um, and this relates also to the question that Stephen Levy asks about the relationship of e-history and the big lie, um, that uh, the, the way that certain interpretations of events can be spread virally by people with an agenda, um, and there is no, there is no way to, uh, let's say, saying saying no, that's not correct, is not the way to stop something from getting to be viral. And so, how do we deal with, you know, basically, how do we save veracity in the face of virality, or is that, or are we already lost on that subject? Well, if it's any consolation, I mean, <laughs> there's been. 
all kinds of horrible information that's gone viral before social media, right? And so any historian can tell you that. You don't have to look too far. You can look to the 20th century, the 19th century. We actually did a whole uh, event on Clubhouse in the early days of History Club about histories of disinformation, looking at yep. disinformation and misinformation campaigns from the 16th century and the 18th century and the 19th century. So I think so, on, I think at certain times, maybe we put too much blame on social media, which is ironic considering the book that I just wrote. But you know, <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, social media didn't invent misinformation and disinformation. Right. And certainly information has spread virally, virally through networks before there were things like Twitter and Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, so... So that's why with this book, I was really interested in looking at the mechanics and what's going on behind the scenes. Because ultimately what I want people to do after they've read this book is I want them to encounter content online and ask the question, why am I seeing this? Why is this showing up in my feed now? Mm -hmm. Is it because it's been going viral and someone has purposely designed it to go viral? Is it because it features a visually arresting image that has captured my attention. And maybe I need to interrogate that image a little more to find out well, what it is and where it came from. Um, is it because it's been crowdsourced to my attention and maybe crowdsourced by nefarious actors such as those associated with January 6th, for example? Uh, I think if we can start asking ourselves those types of questions, then we start to make some headway in this conversation about media literacy and historical literacy. There will always be bad information that spreads. But I think we have, an, we have this challenge now with this ecosystem we've built where we have to somehow or other get ourselves to take that pause and ask those questions. And I was actually very pleased last week when I heard from somebody that he said, after he read my book, all of a sudden he was looking at his Amazon Alexa very differently. Whereas before <laughs> he would ask questions to Amazon Alexa and he would get an answer and he would just move on with the rest of the day. Now he's asking himself the question, hmm, where did it get that information from? And is that something I can verify? Mm -hmm. And that to me seems like a big win. Like if that is what comes out of this book, I feel like that's a huge victory. So we will never be able to stop all lies and misinformation and dishonest actors, but we can at least begin to start asking better questions about the stuff that we see online. And I think that applies to all these types of things, whether it be Holocaust education or you know political conspiracies or any number of different challenges that we may face. Well, and, and the idea, and as Peter Dachowski uh, makes this point, and you bring it up in your book as well, that, and, and as you just said, to a certain extent, right, not only is misinformation always been out there, but the, the tension between, let's say, professional history, historians, however defined, and popular historians, however defined, is also not new, right? You always have the, the grumbling, right? The person who writes the thousand page biography of the founding uh, the, the, of one of the founders with lots of footnotes grumbles that the money is more money is made by the person who writes the book that uh, the, the, the journalist who writes the book who gets out there and, and sells more copies because it's shorter and it's easier to read. Um, how can we imagine using these, uh, using the materials that we have at hand to, uh, you know, you talk about changing incentive structures, you talk about encouraging experts to reach broader audiences. What are some concrete ways in which we could uh, uh, bring those worlds together, that we could bring this up? I mean, you used to be an editor at Made by History. I've written essays for Made by History in the Washington Post, which is a great way for sort of historical things with a news peg to, to get out. But are there, you know, how can we try to get the public to not just get interested in history in some broad sense, but also to be aware of the, the richness and the complexity of historical arguments? Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say, like, you know, you've read the book. Other people on the call may not have read the book, but I will say that, um, you know, this book is not a nostalgia for the good old days of the 20th century. Where Definitely only, not. Where yeah. only people like you and me could become sort of <laughs> experts, right? I mean, right. history profession has a huge diversity problem. And I think it's like 3% Asian American, 6 or 7% African American. Like, so I'm a fan of gatekeeping coming down. And I think mm -hmm. we need to get more people into history classes, more people into profession, the more diverse perspectives that we have, the better as far as I'm concerned. So I do not have any... Uh, in, you know, inklings to go back to 1950 where everyone was Richard Hofstetter and, and that's the way <laughs> history should be. Right, for sure. So, right, but I think that some people maybe might think that based on the title of the book or just some of the ways that we've been talking. But that's, that's not what this book is about. Right. Um, but I do say at the end of the book that 
uh, and this is where I, you had talked about at the beginning about how e-history has sort of rewired all of our collective brains, right? Which is something I talk about in the book. You know, I think that um, because the web is user-centric and so much of the web we use is user-centric, that is now people's expectations for experiences off the web as well. Mm. And so I make the point in the, in the conclusion to the book that I think history education has become more user-centric. It's not about experts standing up in front of the room and talking for 55 minutes about how much they know. Uh, that doesn't engage the users. That doesn't engage the sensibilities of younger consumers who are used to interacting with things primarily online and primarily through their phones. Mm -hmm. I think there are opportunities for history education, history museums, and all kinds of institutions to experiment with much more user-centric types of learning and experiences that will potentially bring people in and that will allow people to see the past with all the nuance and complexity and richness that you and I see it for. Mm -hmm. But I think the whole design needs to be rethought. And this is one of the reasons why I've started the History Communication Institute, uh, which is just in its very early stages, only a few months old. But I, I want there to be a place where we can have those conversations and they don't really happen at the American Historical Association or even at FBRI, to be honest. Um, so we need a space where those types of conversations and experimentation can happen. And for now, the History Communication Institute is being funded by my cryptocurrency, but hopefully we can begin to generate more funding and more donations and grants and things like that so that we can build that space for mm -hmm. that type of experimentation, which as you know, is so difficult to do inside of academia or inside of traditional brick and mortar institutions for a lot of reasons that we will not get into now, but we could talk about another time. We certainly could, right? The, the, the whole problem of, you talk about incentive structures, right? You know, one of the things that for a professional historian, somebody with an, or an academic historian, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the phrase professional historian because I, I'm not sure what that, what that means um, uh, in the sense that lots of people can make money doing history, but for, for historians in academic circles, right? Everybody talks about whether you're supposed to produce stuff, but there's always this talk about whether it counts. Right. You know, does it does it count? Right. A, a very famous political scientist, for example, who writes now writes a column in The Washington Post was denied tenure at a very important university because he spent too much time blogging um, and the, and and older members of his department said, you know, that's not real scholarship. Now, of course, that person is now very famous, very famous political scientist at another institution. I won't mention his name because uh, I don't want to embarrass him. But the but, you know, that he turned out just fine and is doing great work. Um, but he had to, he literally almost had his career derailed by people who said, what's this blogging stuff you're doing that is somehow a waste of time. Now, Don Carden has a, has a question, right? He, and he has a, a one sentence message here. He says, you'll please expand on the notion that social media is not real life. Um, and it's not, but at the same time, the way you're describing it though, is, is that real life and social media are harder and harder. They're, they're certainly influencing each other and becoming more like each other, whether we like it or not. Would you say that's a fair statement? I mean, social media is real life for me. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is my life. As far as I know, my, my life is real unless I'm plugged into some machine somewhere. And uh, social media is a part of it. I mean, right. I, I, you know, I use a lot of different platforms for, for my work. So, um, you know, do, is all the information you see on social media accurate? No. Mm -hmm. Is it all rigorously researched? Absolutely not. Um, is it real? Social, yeah, Twitter is a real thing. It exists. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's going anywhere, at least not for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly the values that underpin things like Twitter and Facebook are not going anywhere. And the right. sensibilities that have been inculcated in users are not going anywhere. So uh, it is certainly a very real force in society in a very animating and powerful force in society, even if all the stuff that we see on there is not actually all that accurate. Right. Well, and, and that gets, you know, since we are the Foreign Policy Research Institute, we'll talk about the rest of the world for a second. Um, we have a question from the audience about, well, we're talking a lot about things that are American history, but um, how, how are we seeing this e-history in, uh, based on your research, in other states and other communities uh, in other regions of the world um, in, and in other sort of topics, right, outside of, you know, debates about the American Revolution or the American Civil War or World War II. Um, what's this, what does e-history look like in other countries? Yeah, well, again, this book is really about the mechanisms and what allows 
allows things to become visible. And it turns out that a lot of these mechanisms hold true in a lot of different contexts. Talk about uh, how uh, nationalist groups in Japan have actually used crowdsourcing on platforms like 4chan or 8chan to crowdsource information into the public sphere in a way that has become part of the discourse there. Um, in that chapter on the newsworthy past, I actually looked at an article that a friend of mine wrote in Belgium, where he talked about all the ways that the news media tried to draw historical analogies between COVID and past historical disasters, and how on the bulk, those articles were pretty terrible and actually didn't tell you anything about COVID or teach you anything about the past. Right. So, um, so I think what we're finding is that across countries across uh, different locations, some of these mechanics, there'd be newsworthiness, visually arresting, crowdsourcing, relying on the stuff, they hold true. Now the specific is different, right? Because the topics and the subject matter will be different, but this book is really about the mechanics. And mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. these platforms are now global in nature and used by so many people around the world, the mechanics kind of hold true in a lot of different circumstances. Actually, in the Facebook chapter, I also talk about the Philippines mm -hmm. and how uh, nostalgia was exploited by Duterte and, and his political allies in his rise to power, relying on Facebook there because in the Philippines, 97% of people have Facebook. 97% of the people. Yep. If I'm to sound like my 14 year old second dude. That's something. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, so speaking of, so one, one last question. I see Drew Benfer uh, asked a question as a history teacher. Um, do you believe that we can create performance-based assessments or the like that ask students to demonstrate historical thinking skills and content via social media? Like, do you think we can use social media in history education? What do you think about that? Well, I, I don't think we have a choice since most <laughs> students are getting their information from social media and they're bringing that into the classroom. This is one of the things I heard from teachers who I talked to for this book. Yeah. They, students are coming into the classroom with preconceived ideas about history that they've gotten from social media, whether it be from Instagram or TikTok or you know, Snapchat. Um, young people are not really on Facebook or Meta or MetaFace, whatever it's called, MetaFace. What MetaFace? Um, <laughs> MetaFace. Meta book. Yeah. Meta book, meta book of face. Um, so, uh, so, so we don't have a choice. I think we have to, we have to use social media, but I think we can use it in a way that teaches people media literacy skills. So we yes. can, we can pull up examples on social media and I have some in my book and then we can ask students the question, okay, why do you think you're seeing this now? What mechanisms are bringing this to your attention? What agendas are behind this piece of information? I think that could be a really instructive way to use social media content about history as a means to further historical literacy, media literacy, and promote further investigation. And so if folks like this gentleman who asked that question want to email me offline, I would be glad, glad to you know, talk, bounce ideas off, brainstorm around that topic. That's great. Because the, the idea, once again, is that, that even, one needs to recognize the way these tools work in order to figure out how to use them without, to use them in a way that's you know, beneficial and, and educational. I mean, I, I guess I, I, I said that, I'm sorry, that, I'm, that's kind of a question, but not a very good one, but I wanna- Oh, well, just quick, I was putting a, I was putting a link ahead. in the chat because uh, actually pinned on my Twitter account right now, I just put the link in there, is actually a rubric that we developed when I was at the LePage Center actually. Which I, which I have heard from people is actually a, a great tool to use in the classroom. I know several uh, teachers who are using this, whether at the college level or at the high school level. Ooh. And it's actually uh, a little guide for discerning good history from bad on the web. So even something like this could be a starting point for some classroom exploration and some exercises and some media literacy skill building. And, you know, from there, it could be fleshed out. And, you know, it's not a perfect document, but I think it, it could give people some ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, at, Jason, this, is, this, is a, this has been a really good conversation. We are just about out of time. I'm trying to think about one last good question to toss at you. But I, I, I guess I've, when, you, when we, we talk about how 
Silicon Valley, the values of Silicon Valley have gradually absorbed so many other values and mores. And so far, at least, right, that, that uh, they seem to be ascendant. Um, how can we imagine, as, you, as, as we've talked about several times, right, how can we imagine um, somehow transcending those values and mores or those approaches um, when we are dependent, so far at least, materially on stuff that is produced from Silicon Valley? I mean, are we, um, are we trapped in this valley uh, forever? I don't think so, because we all collectively had a hand in making it. And so mm -hmm. we can have a collective hand in unmaking it. And I think we have enormous power as users, power that we don't always recognize or utilize. Because these platforms are based on extrinsic value and valuations, right? They are dependent on us using them. And so they only have value if we continue to engage with them and play by their rules. If we change the way we behave and change our use, then that forces them to adapt. And we have actually seen that over the past couple of years, right? Because through congressional pressure and public pressure and work that's been done by our intelligence communities, we have forced Facebook and Twitter to take down uh, disinformation sites and hostile mm -hmm. foreign actors accounts that were doing things on the platform for years, uh, unfettered and, and unmolested. Um, so I think we have an opportunity here to seize the power that we have and create, collectively create something better. And I think sometimes it feels a little bit too overwhelming to think that that's possible, but there was a time in this country where we didn't think Confederate monuments would ever come down and now they're coming down left and right. So, um, you know, it, it's not a guarantee that Facebook and Twitter will have this grip over our lives uh, for the rest of our time. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities and power, I feel, and hopefully this book can be the starting point for some of those conversations. Well, that's a good way to end it, right? So we are still talking about, right? Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present can influence how we think about the past. And we are in the present and we control our present. So maybe we should get down to the business of thinking about how we are dealing with the past. Um, that's a lot of that's a lot of tenses there, but for a very relaxed conversation, Jason, it's been a real pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. History Disrupted is available in bookstores. It's available both in the hardcover version that uh, that Jason is holding and on your device of choice, as they like to say. Um, you know, once again, we can you you fight the cold with the cold's own weapons. So uh, you know, get it any way that you can. Get your hands on a copy of History Disrupted to read it and discuss it. Um, FPRI would love to thank our sponsors and partners for their generous support for this program and to all of you for joining us here on Zoom. Uh, it's been a delight to talk to you, Jason Steinauer, about your book. But today's conversation is just the beginning. The world goes on and we will be here to discuss it at FPRI. If you've enjoyed our discussion today, tell a friend and bring a friend next time as we gather to discuss and analyze our complex world. To keep up with future episodes of People, Politics, and Prose, and you knew this was coming, and other events at FPRI, visit our website site, fpri.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. You can follow the host of this program on Twitter, at Ronald Granary. You can follow our guest, at Jason Steinauer, and you really should. But uh, until next time, for all of us at FPRI, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>